Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. Disclaimer, this recording is not intended to be utilized as medical advice or a medical diagnosis. If you think you're in need of medical attention or treatment, please seek it immediately. This recording will also contain sensitive subjects such as binging and purging, weight and depression. Please listen at your own discretion and do what you think is best for you. Hello, 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 everyone. Happy Friday morning. It's actually Wednesday of this week when I'm recording this. Today, we're going to be talking about trauma, an overview of what trauma is. It's a huge thing you hear all the time now um, that is talked about, but obviously it's been known that trauma um, affects us for a long, long time and that it's very clearly correlated with eating disorders and people who have experienced trauma are much more likely to also experience or suffer from an eating disorder. So I thought it's been long enough. I should talk about the subject. I need to talk about the subject. People need to hear about it and best tips for how to deal with it and where to go and what you might be struggling with. But before that, I just want to say hello. It's been a little while since I have recorded a podcast. If you don't, if you just want to get to the episode, please skip ahead like two to three minutes. You know the drill. If you're a longtime listener, um, that will be the meat of the episode. But first of all, I finally fixed my mic on my computer and it is literally now right in front of my face. So you guys watching on YouTube, it's like, it's almost covering my face, but hopefully the sound quality is much better. And I tell you guys for three weeks, not, you know, entirely the three weeks, but over the past three weeks, I've been trying to fix my mic. I unplugged it from my computer so I could position it to be in a better place that the sound quality is better for the podcast. But then when I plugged it back in, it wasn't working. Like it just wouldn't, my computer would not acknowledge that the mic existed anymore. And so I restarted my computer. I unplugged it from the computer, plugged it back in. And then um, the USB port to the computer. And I looked online, they were saying like, there's all sorts of things you need to do. There's, you know, it might be that your computer will never recognize it again and restart it with it plugged in, blah, blah, blah. And this morning, I was like, I'm going to have to record on my phone again for the sound quality. Why haven't I figured this out? And this time I got a little creative. I was like, what if I unplug the port that plugs into the mic back in and back out? And then I unplugged it from my computer and plugged it back in. And you know what? It works. It works perfectly as if nothing happened. Uh, Such a simple, stupid solution to a, a seemingly complex problem. And I think that is such a metaphor for life, right? We oftentimes, me, I'm an anxious person, or I can't be an anxious person. And I'm so notoriously an overthinker. I make things so much more complicated than it has to be. And a lot of my clients do too. And that is why it's beneficial to talk to someone because they can help you see through the bullshit that's in your own brain and give you a logical, simple solution. Anyway, so I thought that was a funny story to to share my technical difficulties. In other news, I actually had two clients yesterday. I wanted to share this. I shared on Instagram already, but two clients yesterday told me they wanted to re-up working with me. They wanted to sign up for more coaching, even though, you know, they've gotten past bulimia recovery and all that stuff. And I'm sharing partly because it's a brag, because it's cool to know people want to keep on working with you, but it's also to show you that it's not just about recovery. That's not your end goal to recover from bulimia. Your end goal is to keep on going through your life and making it bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what these people want to do. They told me like these calls are so helpful, not just for bulimia recovery, but growing in every area of my life and continually putting me on a path to my future goals. And they're worried. They're talking about their career, their relationships, their um, goals in their personal life, everything. And it also keeps them on track with eating and food too. I think it's just amazing. So I'm feeling on a high from that. Getting some compliments always makes me feel good, but I wanted to let you guys know that when you sign up for bulimia recovery, it's not just recovery. That is not the end goal. That is the start of, that's like the boulder you have to move to get to the other side. And then that's the end goal, which is never ending. It's just growing your life and enjoying it and flourishing in it. So hopefully that makes sense. But without further ado, 
let's talk about trauma, baby. <laughs> Have you seen those reels on Instagram? Uh, I hate referencing reels, but it's everywhere now. Those reels on Instagram where it's like, you're so mature for your age. It's trauma, baby. <laughs> that, is, that is so accurate. Um, but today I'm going to talk about trauma. I have actually been working with a client who's gone through some very intense trauma. And I always have said in the past, you know, I'm not an expert on trauma. And I'd, I still would say that I'm not a trauma expert. I don't exclusively try to work with people with trauma. And I don't think coaching is always for people with trauma. Um, it depends on the situation, what they work through. Coaching can be beneficial for people with trauma. But a lot of times people that have experienced trauma, especially maybe more extreme traumas, we'll talk about the differences in a bit, they need to go through um, some therapy first and other things before they get coaching on their trauma, because there is a phase in trauma where you need to just explore it and accept it and go through what that is. Anyway, I'll explain that later, but I've never claimed to be a trauma expert, so I've always kind of steered away from the topic, but it's so, so important for eating disorder. So I finally like bucked up and I'm like, you know what? No, I need to do this. And especially since I've been working with a client who she came to me through bulimia recovery, but she also has had some extremely intense trauma that um, the stuff she had to go through, like it's, it's a miracle she survived. So that has been a learning experience for me. And, you know, she signed up with me knowing that I wasn't talking about eating disorders, but of course, I have been trying to learn up and get much better at helping people with trauma because I know if I want to be the best coach I can be, then I can't just ignore that topic or just like say, oh, it's, you know, I can't help you with that. Anyway, so today I want to deep dive into that. So what is trauma? First of all, if you guys that don't know, I'm sure most of you know, since you're listening to this podcast, usually podcast listeners are smart people, first of all. So you listening, you're a smart cookie. Um, they usually are well-versed in a lot of topics, but trauma can be defined as a deeply distressing or disturbing event. And what people don't know is they think about trauma as just extremes. They think about trauma as, oh, being sexually abused, being um, physically abused, right? Just being beaten or assaulted in any shape or form. Um, maybe they think of extreme psychological trauma where they grew up with an abusive parent. Childhood trauma is a big thing, right? Um, or they think of a mat. Uh, they think of basically physical things or like a war or some disaster happened. And yes, those are traumas, right? That is a traumatic experience and it affects you. But then there's also traumas that people overlook because they're not as extreme, but they do affect you. For example, we have all gone through trauma in the um, through the COVID-19 uh, thing that has gone on, right? The, our world one day just changed. We suddenly couldn't go out. We were suddenly fearful for our lives. We suddenly couldn't see our family anymore. Things taken away um, and unknown. We were living in a state of unknown for a long time and we still kind of are. And the world, as we know it, will never go back to the same thing ever again, right? It may be similar, but it's we can't forget. And that is a traumatic experience. Maybe it didn't affect you as, as harshly as it might if someone beat you, right? But it still affected you nonetheless. We've all gone through that. Another, I think, really good example of uh, trauma, especially given this Black History Month as well, but always, is if you are a person of color or in a minority, you might experience trauma every single day from racism, right? From people, from even just, if even if you didn't, let's say, experience racism, racism in the world that day, um, someone didn't come up and say something to you, you still experience like the fear constantly every day of, is someone going to do something awful to me? Is someone going to say something? Is someone thinking that I am other or um, judging me for the color of my skin, right? And that's a traumatic thing. It's a chronic trauma to experience every single day. So that can be considered a trauma, right? Just the trauma of being someone of color, right? And having to live and experience yourself in a world like that. And fear of what people might do to you because you've seen what can happen to other people of color, right? That is a trauma people don't like, don't talk about, but it is a thing. Other examples of trauma can be a death or a loss, like it, losing a grandparent, right? That's something we all have to go through at some point, losing parents when we're older or younger. 
that is a traumatic loss, right? It is a trauma. It's a significant event that upsets you and affects you long-term, not only physically, but, um, but also mentally. We'll talk about that in a bit, but then some other examples also can be um, moving. Like let's say you're moving schools or you're moving to a new place. Even if it's a good thing, it can still be a little bit of a trauma to, um, to go through a whole new experience and leave and uproot yourself from where you were. And a financial loss, that is also a trauma, right? Especially if it's completely devastating. Now there's, there's, I don't even know where the concept came from, but there's something called big T and little T, like big trauma, little trauma. Here's what I want to say right here and now. Um, of course, there are traumas that can be much more significant and usually affect people more on a general grand scale, but it is okay to still be affected by smaller things. And No matter what you experience, your pain is your pain. So it doesn't matter if someone's experienced bigger trauma than you, you're still experiencing the trauma that you've experienced and you have to deal with those feelings. Whether you think that, oh, I shouldn't be worried about this as much or it shouldn't be affecting me the way it is, it is. It is affecting you. And so whether you want to, you know, sit there and judge yourself for that or might as well just accept that, oh, this is the pain I have to experience. Also, you know, if you can help it, you don't want to experience gigantic traumas in your life if you can help it we will all probably experience some sort of gigantic trauma at some point in our lives it's just it's probably going to happen because you're a human but I just want to say that everyone's pain even though like maybe not all traumas are equal let's say in the grand scale they still are your pain and it's okay to experience the pain of that don't judge yourself for experiencing a trauma that some people might not say is that valid or as serious it still affects you Now, I think a lot of people know this as well, but trauma does change you. It's not just, oh, you experience that event and you get over it. No, trauma actually can physically change you. Um, It changes how you behave in the world because of that thing that you have experienced. You now have different thoughts in your head. You have different things that you remember. You experience the world differently from that trauma. Um, And not only is it just like, oh, you remember that, so you act differently, but it can cause physical changes in, um, in your body, in your brain. Trauma, as we know it, can literally rewire your brain, right? It can change things. And for example, I've talked to people where they literally have flashbacks. They have certain triggers that no matter what they do, no matter how much thought work they do, they can obviously get to a point where they are functional, but that trauma will always be there and always be flashing back, giving them um, that kind of like they're experiencing the trauma that happened a long time ago. Here is a quote directly from the CDC from 2012. Um, And I thought it was a really good overview of how trauma can affect you. Quote, as a clear, clear example, early ACEs such as abuse, neglect, and other trauma effects, traumas affect the brain development and increase a person's vulnerability to encountering interpersonal violence as an adult and to developing chronic diseases and other physical illnesses, mental illnesses, substance related disorders, and impairment in other areas of life, end quote. So it really isn't just like that event and then it goes away. Trauma seriously, seriously impacts you. Um, Other things, it can cause cognitive errors, meaning people misinterpreting or overreacting to normal situations. For example, I have a friend who they experienced um, a lot of abuse as a child, um, not safe environments as a child. And that friend, if, if we hang out, they're constantly on guard a little bit more than I would be uh, in normal situations because they have experienced assault. They have experienced physical abuse. And so they know, maybe they know the seriousness of it and they can't, they can't not remember that. They can't let that go. And they may just overreact. This is just one person in particular, but um, a lot of people, it's the same case. Uh, one of my, my clients, she uh, experiences flashbacks and overreactions whenever she exercises. It will take her back to the abuse that she suffered through and struggled through. It will really remind her, especially of the physical and sexual abuse that she struggled with, just major flashbacks. And she always has to practice calming herself down, self-regulating in that moment. So again, trauma isn't just the event, but it can then affect you for a long time to come. Um, and it also can create excessive or inappropriate guilt. A lot of people that have struggled with trauma, they feel like it's their fault. It's somehow um, they to make sense of it cognitively. Uh, sometimes they try to assume the responsibility for that trauma to make sense of the situation, which is 
obviously not the case. And that's a huge thing to work through, but that is the thing that happens. Intrusive thoughts or memories, trauma induced hallucinations or delusions, idealizations, and more. And just the physical effects of the body. I know that people with trauma, they can they can be more likely to experience headaches and hold tension, especially in their neck and traps uh, a lot more than other people because their body is always tense from that holding onto the dangers of the past, right? And I think with people in trauma, it's always a fight of reminding yourself that you are safe now in the present, you are okay, you're not necessarily in danger of what you once were in danger of. And it's constantly trying to self-regulate and remind your body that you are okay, you are in the now, you are not in the past. And I think that's one of the significant things people struggle with. Also, it depends on the trauma, but you know, people that have maybe struggled with abuse, both sexual and physical, um, the experience kind of this concept of you know, losing their autonomy, right? People completely taking control over their bodies. And that is a hard thing to grapple with and it makes you feel very unsafe. And so something that's really important for trauma survivors and people that have gotten through that is to kind of develop their own sense of autonomy. But having that taken away from you is a very scary experience, very traumatizing. And I speak from, you know, never experiencing something extreme like that. Although I did experience, you know, some violent situations in, in uh, my childhood. And I was never at a huge risk of being hurt, but there were some times where I, you know, was scared and um, that affects you for sure. It like makes you, especially if the person that was the person you you were scared of that abused you or um, acted violently or anything, it can be hard to be around them, even if they have changed, because you're worried that they might freak out and, and that, that sticks with you for a long time. You can't forget those things. Another quote from Nita, nationaleatingdisorders.org. I love this um, site and this organization. They're a great, great resource for anyone struggling with eating disorders. Um, is that they said the exact mechanism for why trauma contributes to the development of an eating disorder is unclear. What is known is that trauma can cause disruption in the nervous system, which may make it difficult for individuals to manage their emotions. And so they turn to eating disorder behaviors or other addictions as a way of to manage these uncomfortable emotions. Sexual trauma may specifically cause body image issues, partly related to self-critical view that can develop after sexual trauma. Some victims may be uh, may wish to be thin to reduce their attractiveness or may gain weight in the case of those with binge eating disorder to accomplish the same goal. Um, so you can read that on nationaleatingdisorders.org. Uh, but yeah, people that have suffered from trauma are much more likely to struggle with eating disorders and other addiction um, other addictions, basically addictive behaviors, that sort of thing. And that's, we all know that sometimes it can be, the eating disorder can be a way to, with sexual trauma, make yourself less attractive, but it can also be a way to establish control again, especially when your life is feeling out of control. I think when my eating disorder first started in high school, I had just moved to a different high school, lost my friend group. Um, I had gone through kind of a significant relationship ending. One of my best friends, we actually repaired things, but during the middle school phase, like our friendship kind of crumbled and I felt very alone and I felt chaotic and they were just, and I lost like a core thing, which was swimming to me. And so all those things combined, I think my eating disorder really came from a place of wanting to control something and it being my identity. And while that wasn't significant trauma, it was definitely traumatic, right? To switch those things, even though I wanted those things to happen in some ways. And so I think sometimes after trauma, it can be also a form of control. We all know eating disorders can be that. And and something that is occupying your mind, something to focus on that isn't the trauma, that isn't the things that are really bothering you. Eating disorder can be a nice avenue for not having to worry about other things and deal with other things. You can just be with food and be with the binging and the numbing that that provides. Although I will say in high school, my eating disorder was a lot less focused on binging and a lot more focused on just controlling my food and controlling how much I ate when I ate it and, um, and weight. Hopefully I've given you a good picture of what trauma is and how it can affect you, but it seriously stays with you for a long time. So what do people do? Are they just stuck with these traumas forever? Once it happens, you can never change that and you can never improve or get stronger or be a survivor. You're just a victim to that forever. No, there's a lot of things you can do to improve the psychological effects of 
trauma and the physical effects of trauma, but it's a work in progress. And again, I don't think you ever like, for example, my client that experienced the abuse and the traumatic situations that she experienced, that will never leave her. It will, she'll never forget those things, right? So even if she manages to, to, to fix all of the psychological trauma or psychological damages uh, or just changes, not necessarily damages, but changes that occurred and physical changes that occurred, she will still remember and facts stick with you and they change the way you think because it's knowledge, right? And knowledge is something that will always continue shaping your opinions of the world. Um, but there, for that being said, there are lots of ways to improve and live and thrive even when you've experienced significant trauma. And so let's talk about some of those options. I'll first talk about actual treatments that are recommended for people. Um, and maybe that can help you, especially if you've experienced trauma and you're looking into those things. And then I'll, I'll talk about some practical things you can do, whether you seek support or not, to help you along the way with your trauma, partly from my own experience of helping people and what I know to be best and then what other people recommend as well. So as far as therapy goes, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most recommended things for trauma, which is just um, the act, basically, that the therapy focuses on the relationship among thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And that is a lot of what I do in my coaching, too. It's, it's obviously not therapy. It's a different thing entirely. We focus a lot more on the present and future-oriented goals. And I also you know, work with people that can function uh, in, at a job, at a day job. They're mentally well enough to do that. But a lot of coaching borrows practices from cognitive behavioral therapy because your thoughts are so important to what you do and the results that you create in your life. So cognitive behavioral therapy can really work on reshaping those thoughts and uh, feelings that you have that may have been uh, changed from the trauma. And it focuses on that. And then there's also cognitive processing therapy, cognitive therapy, and prolonged exposure. Now, prolonged exposure is a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy that teaches individuals to gradually approach trauma-related members feelings, and situations. By facing what has been avoided, a person presumably learns that the trauma-related memories and cues are not dangerous and do not be need to be avoided. So basically exposure therapy, prolonged exposure therapy. And this is really important in trauma. I think people, um, they don't want to explore those things because they are painful experiences. You, you just want to not think about it. But then when you don't, go back to it, never quite gets resolved and you can never get strong enough to um, embrace those things. This reminds me of one time when, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be, I, I idealized people that seemed emotionless, emotionless. And that's probably because of some of the traumatic, traumatic events that happened in my childhood and the pain I experienced. I remember thinking it would be better just to not feel this pain at all be better just to not care. It would be better to not care is what I used to think. Obviously, I know better now, but I carry that belief into my adulthood. And I had a coaching session one time where I was talking to someone about how like, I hated my emotions. I hated that I felt things. I hated that I was crying and in pain and I wanted to be in control of my emotions. And the best solution I had had for that was to just push them down and not I react to them and not to try to process them and just ignore them. And obviously, so this would lead to me being having completely like outlandish reactions to, to things like my boyfriend not doing the dishes. I would just freak out, you know, and I would have lots of untapped rage and not understanding what was going on. And then because I wouldn't practice feeling my emotions, I would have those outbursts and I wouldn't know how to control them whatsoever because I would avoid them. And so this person asked me, she's like, it seems like the person that you're being when you're just trying to avoid your emotions is actually someone who's out of control and, and weak and doesn't know how to process their emotions. Maybe if you let, let yourself feel your emotions, you might have a lot better control over it because you get practice over and over and over again. And I was the type of person who, like I didn't want to cry at, at movies because I thought that made me weak. And yet, of course, like when I actually started crying and couldn't help it anymore, then I just like completely lost my mind because I didn't know how to deal with any type of feeling whatsoever. And so the exposure therapy to bring it back to trauma, it kind of reminds me of that is that you need to get used to those feelings, to process that pain, to hold it, you know, metaphorically in your hands and 
continually expose yourself to that. Like fear exposure is a real thing, right? Exposing yourself to your fears instead of avoiding them. So you can get stronger and stronger and stronger until, you know, again, maybe it'll affect you for the rest of your life, but it doesn't debilitate you anymore. That's what all these therapies can help with. There are also some more advanced therapies that uh, are offered. I don't know as much about them, so I'm not going to speak to them, but I will list them off here uh, just so you can be aware and look at your own things. Also, I'm getting this list of therapies from uh, www.apa.org. Again, a great organization. But the other list of conditionally recommended therapies are brief electric, um, brief eclectic psychotherapy, Eye movement, just the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing EMDR therapy and narrative exposure therapy. And obviously medications can be recommended for people that have experienced trauma. Obviously it's something you need to talk about with your doctor and therapist and, and psychiatrist, but please know that there are options out there for you. I'm going to talk about other things you can do, but I'll say this right here, please. If you've experienced some sort of trauma, whether it is big trauma or small trauma. If you feel like you've experienced it, you probably have. Even if it maybe a doctor wouldn't say, oh, that's trauma. It means that it's bothered you enough to think it's significant and you need some sort of support on it. I strongly believe everyone should get the help that they need. I think people should have whole teams working for them if that were financially possible. Um, So if you are thinking, I've experienced something that really upset me, you probably need to go to therapy or get some coaching or something. Go talk to someone, your friend. If you're, if it's coming up in your mind, it's significant enough that you should get help on it. Okay. Let's talk about some practical things that you can do whether or not you get support. Although I'd highly recommend that you get support for your trauma. Let's talk about some things that you can do um, in the meantime between that support that might help you significantly. The first thing I'll say is that you should and shouldn't talk about your trauma, or you may want to talk about your trauma, and then you also don't have to talk about your trauma. What I mean by this is there's a lot of research, obviously therapy, there's a whole therapy is dedicated to just talking about your trauma. Going over it can be really, really helpful. Just exploring what happened, talking about it in a safe environment with someone that you trust, doesn't necessarily have to be a therapist, but someone can really help your brain make sense of it, especially sometimes in traumas that are extremely violent, your brain might just try to not remember that at all. It might just try to bury it away, but it's still there and it's still affecting you physically and mentally. That's why you might be carrying tension and always be tense and have headaches um, and feel fatigued, but you don't know why, maybe unprocessed trauma. And so talking about it at some point is going to be really helpful for making sense of that situation and processing through. Uh, my client that struggled with uh, some extreme abuse, she has gone through therapy before. She's gone through a lot of therapy to process that. So I'm not the first one to talk about that with her. But sometimes we have had sessions where she just rehashes what that trauma was. And I just, we just talk about it in detail so that her brain can still make sense of all of that. And the more she talks about it, the more she puts the pieces together and feels release from that trauma. And it also helps make sense to her brain that this happened then, it's not still happening now. And so sometimes talking about it out loud can really solidify those things because sometimes your brain will still have those flashbacks. It'll still think, no, we're still in danger now. And when you put times and dates to that trauma, you actually talk about what happened, though it's really scary and triggering at first, it can help you actually realize clearly when it happened. And it's easier to remember it that way instead of what your brain might be manifesting. Hopefully that makes sense, but that can be extremely beneficial. Now on the flip side, you don't have to talk about your trauma. I do think at some point you have to, but also don't talk about your trauma all the time. Also go out and experience things, conversations with people that have nothing to do with your trauma because it's important for your brain to move on. It's important for you to process it, but it's also important for you to experience other things in life, make new memories, especially memories where you feel safe and wanted and loved and enjoyment and happiness. Those are equally as important. Please don't think that every conversation has to be about your trauma. Um, Obviously, if you feel the need to talk about it, talk about it, but also try to do things that don't include it. This is the same thing I talk about in bulimia recovery. Just as important as it is to talk about your struggles with bulimia and focus on it, 
also equally important to move on and make new memories and expand the void that bulimia was taking up with other things in your life. Same thing with trauma. Go out, get support, enjoyment, happiness. Laughter is the best cure, right? Smiles are the best cure. Please, please go and make some happy memories and talk with people about things that are happening now, not in the past and not in the trauma. Some other helpful things you can do in terms of socialization is joining a support group for people that have also struggled with that trauma. Um, so not only just talking with people that are professionals that can help you with it and friends, but also finding a group of people that you can meet with maybe once a week or once a month, depends on where you're at in your journey and how much you want to talk to them. But people that have gone through your experience, uh, especially like, you know, when you think of people that experience death they go to a grief counseling group with other people that have experienced death in the way that they have, because they get it. They've understand, understand your exact experience. That's why so many of you listen to the podcast, because the way I describe bulimia, you really see that I've experienced it. I have been through it. I've been, I've eaten like food out of the trash, right? Like that's how bad it was for me at some point. I've been through that experience. And that's why you feel connected to me in some ways, because you know what it's like to pick food out of the trash that hasn't been touched by the, the trash, right? Like I've, I've explained that to other people before and they look, they give me a face like, really, why would you do that? Um, and it's like, or, or why would you feel the need to spray Windex on the food that you just put in the trash? You're never going to get it. It's out of the trash. But I was at that point in that situation where I felt desperate enough to get the food out of the trash. And so <laughs> just like you get that I understand bulimia, it's also helpful to talk to people who have been through the same situation as you and understand, can uh, commiserate with you, can support you, and you guys can grow stronger together. It's very vital for someone who's experienced some sort of trauma. Um, and again, not just big trauma like sexual abuse or a disaster, but also little trauma, right? People that have experienced a financial burdens or just, just people that are in the same walk of life of you and have to experience the little traumas that you have to. Please find your people. Um, another thing that could be helpful is volunteering, particularly with maybe people that have struggled with the same thing you have. Like some people have gone through drug addictions and have recovered and the trauma of that is severe, but then they go and volunteer to help other people who are addicted and get through that. And speaking from experience, I help people that have been through bulimia when I went through it myself. And that rewards me in so many ways. It really fulfills me to help people out of the same situation I have been. And it also cements my belief for continuing to get stronger and continuing to stay recovered. And so that could be helpful for you if you have made, um, gone through trauma. Another often overlooked, but very, very important part of, uh, Trauma recovery can be to get moving, to exercise, to move your body. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but exercise obviously is known to have so many benefits for reducing anxiety and stress. And that is one of the huge things in trauma recovery, right? And the tension you're holding and the fear that you're holding and moving the body can really, uh, up top of the, all other benefits of exercise, it can really help you release some of that at stress. Also, it can be helpful to incorporate a mindfulness exercise um, while you are exercising, especially with the client I have who struggles with exercise or she struggles with trauma, but sometimes when she's exercising, she experiences flashbacks from trauma. And something that is helpful for her is just tapping into what those feelings are. Because what her brain can do is it can take her away from reality and make her feel like she's back in that abusive situation. She's back there. She's in that moment again. And so it's helpful to just focus in on, no, these, these are the feelings that are happening right now. This is what my body feels like right now. I'm not back there. I am here. So incorporating a mindfulness element can be really helpful. Another important thing for trauma is obviously getting sleep super, super important. Your brain cannot function without sleep and proper nutrition, trying to get balanced meals in. Obviously, if you have some donuts, not a big deal, but try to be getting at least a few meals in a day that have something green, some carbs, some fats, and some protein in. So it's going to, and some micronutrients in so that it's going to keep fueling you and giving you the nutrients you need to not only survive, but heal from the trauma. Also, something that can be really bad for people with trauma is having lots of alcohol or drugs, um, especially when you're at more of a risk to develop an addiction, it might be helpful for you to not go on those things 
for a little while and just see how you feel. And then a huge thing in trauma recovery is obviously regulating your nervous system, right? Self-regulating, self-soothing. You can do this in a lot of ways. Obviously, exercise is a great way to do that. Moving your body, stretching, but also breathing is something. I know everyone rolls their eyes when I say breathing. I talk about it all the time. But slowing your heart rate down, slowing that breath down, mindfully breathing is been shown time and time again to be really effective for reducing stress, anxiety, and regulating your body. Um, your breath is very important. If you're taking, if you're just hunched over in your chair and when you're hunched over, just simply is that you are having kind of crushing your lungs and chest a little bit, and you're not able to take as um, deep of breaths, just taking shallower breaths, uh, breaths affect how you feel and make you feel worse. It makes you feel like, like you're panicking or something, right? It doesn't feel as good. And something as simple as that affects your mood. So sitting up straight, taking deep breaths, calmly and controlled and slowing down that breath can be helpful, helpful exercise for anyone, but especially someone who's struggled with trauma. Another thing is to feel it when you feel it. Allow yourself to feel your emotions when they're coming in, especially if you're having a flashback or a moment where it's really affecting you, instead of trying to push it away, please try to be open to it and let it wash through you. Emotions can be like a storm, right? You have to let them pass. You can't stop the rain. The rain is coming, whether you like it or not, you might as well just embrace that it's happening and move through it and, and try to get to the other side. You can't avoid it altogether, or it's just going to burst and it's not going to be very fun. Or you're just going to be holding on to tension that you don't have to be holding on to. Another great resource I'll point out for you guys. I got, I got a lot of these tips from, you know, working with clients, but also I found this great website called www.helpguide.org. And this article was on PTSD and trauma and coping with emotional and psychological trauma. So they have a whole list of how to take care of yourself during uh, trauma. And I thought it'd be a great resource to point out to you guys too. And they have more things on here than what I said, but these are the main ones that I use and I've recommended to clients as well. Hopefully this episode has been a really good overview for you on what trauma is, what, how, who can experience trauma, you know, like what trauma actually can be considered. Cause I think a lot of people think, oh, I haven't been sexually assaulted. I haven't been physically abused. I haven't experienced a death. Therefore, I haven't experienced trauma. And that's not true. You've definitely, if you're a human being, you've probably experienced some sort of trauma on this earth. So that, that's just like the number one thing I hope you take away from this. But also I hope you take away that trauma, while it affects you for the rest of your life, can make you stronger. Um, maybe that, I haven't even talked about that yet, but you know, people that have survived awful, awful things um, and people that have expi ex experienced even smaller traumas, those things, while they affect you, you can grow from them, you can learn from them, and you can help other people from them. They don't make you weak. They don't make you um, a victim. They just mean you're a survivor and you're a strong one at that. So hopefully that is some push for you to know that while these things can affect you long-term, you can move past them, you can thrive in your life, and you can actually benefit from them long term they affect you they affect you forever but they can, there are some good that can come out of that storm um and then lastly i hope it's encouraged you to maybe seek help uh for what's going on with you and hopefully you've, if you have been dismissing your trauma or dismissing the things going on with you you've realized actually maybe i needed to go talk to someone about this maybe this is the time where i actually reach out for help i hope this episode has been beneficial for you I am going to, well, right now, as I'm recording this, I'm going to go record another episode. But as you guys are listening to this, my parents are actually in Florida. So I'm going to, after this episode airs, go drive over and visit them for the weekend. They're on the um, Gulf side of Florida. So I'm going to drive over and talk to them, hang out with them and do whatever they like to do. Probably just go to the beach and pick up shells and, and have dinner, but it'll be fun. It'll be nice to see my parents. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend and you get to do something that just makes you happy and you enjoy. Uh, and also as always, if you need more support, I offer both private coaching and an online course. You can start your recovery with me today at www.bingebreakers.com. You do not have to struggle with this for, forever. Thank you for listening, my friend. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and please remember to never give up on yourself. Bye.